Hi everyone, I hope everyone's well and safe at home. Uh, so I'm Jurgi from Kingston Libraries and the Alia Graphic Convener. And uh, since everyone's at home and in isolation, we thought it was a good idea to simply have a chat uh, with different people. And today we have a great guest that um, um, I, th I think this will be a really great conversation. And we're talking libraries and we're talking graphic novels, which is everything we love. So um, how are you going, Leonie? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me here with you all today. Yeah, so um, uh, some people will probably know you because I know that you've spoken in different conferences and things like that, but uh, could you introduce yourself? What did you do? What are your interests? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, okay, so uh, I've worked in public libraries for 14 years exactly as at March 6th, um, and I've taken a little sabbatical, I'd like to call it, from working in public libraries very recently and have moved to um, the private sector to write. So essentially I'm paid to create a ton of content and that's actually really exciting for me because my secret, not so secret love is um, writing essentially, hence probably why I did so many research papers and stuff um, as my side hustle while working in public libraries. Um, so I worked for City of Melbourne, City of Yarra and City of Stonington libraries, so in Victoria. Um, and the majority of that time I worked in the young adult space um, and also as a team leader and uh, a couple of the other councils. Um, and a big part of what I did and what I still believe in is that uh, libraries are a really amazing intersection point for um, really powerful social justice activities. And a lot of that can be about connecting people to um, content that will better their lives. And of course, um, what we're here today to talk about are graphic novels. And I think that graphic novels are um, the well understood by those who love them, but not understood at all by people who have no clue about them medium for storytelling and i think it's a, a beautiful storytelling um, platform whether it be through digital comics or through the physical books themselves um, that actually elevates the experience of reading for so many people who may not naturally come to reading because of um, you know dyslexia or other types of um, discomforts that they might have from childhood and reading you know all the books forced on you in high school and of course you just by default go, oh, I hate reading. Um, so I think graphic novels are the great leveler as it were. Um, but yeah, so I've, I guess that's a pretty good summary. I think so. Did I miss yeah. anything? Do I need yeah, anything I, I else? I think that's a pretty yeah. good summary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. You, you've definitely done a lot of things. And, and yeah, um, I've read some of the stuff that you've written and, and and things like that and yeah uh, i've always liked your um perspective on things so so yeah yeah uh, good good work uh, and so, um, i know that you traveled uh, uh uh to a lot of libraries in europe and the us as well as part of a scholarship uh a yeah. few years ago yeah and there was an 85 page report about break uh breaking down barriers and engaging young adults yeah. and things like that um yeah. Could you give us a rundown of your findings? Yeah, so uh, it was very much initially about like how um, public libraries around the globe, especially in Europe and the US, because they're good at it, um, uh, were engaging young adults. And what I found was it wasn't so much that they were physically trying to force young adults to come into the library through events, but they were building spaces that actually said to young adults, you're welcome here, without there having to be a sign or a staff member kind of going, come in, come in, and having to spruik it in any sort of forced and therefore kind of ingenuine, disingenuous kind of way. Um, and so my paper ended up turning into a really um, interesting, and I think I'm, I still have a slight obsession with it, kind of um, a report about the importance of space and the importance of um, creating atmosphere. It's a philosophical concept in architecture, this notion of atmosphere, but um, creating spaces that attract people to them, that help them to feel like they're allowed to be there, that they're welcome to be there without it being super obvious. Um, and it's possible to do that because of course these libraries did do that. But that is in tandem with having staff and people working in public libraries who give a shit about young people in any capacity. And when I talk about young people, I'm talking about like from 13 to 23, 24 years of age. So not adolescents or children, because that's sort of like 
the easy patch, I think, in public libraries. That's kind of the space that you've got an adult acting as a proxy to make sure those young people are getting involved. Whereas once you're a teenager, your, um, your free time is very limited. It's always full of like parents trying to get you to do lots of extracurricular activities to better yourself as a human. And that's why I think my paper ended up being about space is it becomes um, engagement with youth is very much possible if you create spaces that are welcoming and give a sense of belonging. So that's sort of a cap of what that was about. Is that what you picked up on? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. I, and yeah. I think, um, uh, you know, I, um, my background is in media studies, and then I did teaching, uh, and I was a teacher for a few years, and then I came into libraries. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a general librarian, I'm not a children and youth librarian, but I've always been very interested in, in what children and youth librarians do. And, and in seeing kids and teenagers um, at libraries. And I, uh, I often feel like, and this is not a criticism if people from the libraries where I worked are uh, watching, you know, but I often feel like libraries in general, um, especially with teenagers, they feel like, uh, oh, teenagers just don't come to the library. They're not interested. And yeah. I, I often feel like, oh, you've just given up. But is it that they're not coming because they're not interested? Or is it that they're not coming because you're not really creating the right space for them and you're not, uh, you know, uh, maybe having the right uh, events and activities that they would be interested in? You know, yeah, and I feel like when I was a teacher, one thing that I strongly felt about uh, was that teachers, you know, uh, as much as we have right in, uh, the good intentions, very often we don't listen enough to students, and mm -hmm. and I felt like we had to listen to students more. And I feel like at libraries, it's uh, it's a little bit of that as well. We need to listen more to the teenagers and what would yeah. they like at the library. You know? What yeah. would bring them in? Yeah, what do you but they're think not going to give you. Yeah, they're not going to give you that answer though. Off the bat, like if you walk up to one and just be like, "What would you do in the library?" They're going to just be like, "Who are you? I don't know you." Um, so there's definitely like a patch of work around building relationships of trust. Like you've got to be able to like um, break down the, that initial conversational barrier. And a great way to do that is to connect with your youth services departments across your councils um, and get in that way. Like get get permission to like spend time in the events that are being run by youth services, be present at those and invite youth services to come to your events and create that bridge um, that needs to happen. Um, I think that that was something that um, I saw happening quite amazingly at Yara Council was um, the youth department there, the youth services, um, Roop and Chris and all that team were just really, really amazing at being on board with that crossover, that bridging. And it helps mm. because you, you use and, and, and um, tap into the trust relationships that are already existing in the community to be able to bring them into the library or bring them to a library event if it's not at the library. I think um, once you build up those relationships of trust, you're actually able to kind of say that. And I think marketing is super important. Um, we, when I worked at City of Melbourne, I, we just had color coded things. So you kind of knew if the event was for kids, adults or children. It was very rare that any young adult or adult events would have an age on it. It would just say maybe, you know, be at least 13, but it would never say youth event or teen event or something. And it was very much tapped into pop culture, tapped into what could be helpful. Like what, you know, when you think about young adults, I think it's really important to give them the credit of okay so they're 13 so they think they're 16 so what would a 16 year old want to be doing right now and have that pivot to be what a 13 year old could possibly do so you're almost like always leveling up a little bit so you would you know i guess in kind of contemporary times you would think about okay so if somebody was 18 going to uni and studying design what would they be interested in okay we should be offering that to 13 14 15 year olds so it's it's trying to tap into what kind of matters in a contemporary context um and not not being constrained, and this could get me in trouble, not being constrained by the book, essentially. Like you can always bring in reading and you can always bring in the materials and the items that are available at the library to take home and like have that be a pitch after the fact, but use those other channels as the hook to get them into the library or to go to a library event in the first place. 
Um, participatory engagement, so participatory youth work, is something that's worth looking into if people aren't sure about it. And it's what you said. It's about talking to young people and asking them what they care about and not making assumptions about that for events like, do they want pizza or would they actually rather have popcorn at a movie night? You never know. So ask them, don't make that assumption, that kind of thing. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool and pretty empowering, like as an adult, like not a young adult, um, to kind of be able to do that and then see the results of that and just see that, you know, they're just having a good time. Like I went to, um, an after hours event at the Hoppers Crossing Library years ago for young adults. And part of the reason that actually worked for the local community was the library itself had a really good vibe. It had a really nice layout. It had space for young people to kind of just be everywhere, but they partnered with their um, youth department. And I just think that that's, yeah, it's a big part of it is being able to tap into your um, other stakeholders to sound yeah. very formal and corporate, tap into your stakeholders. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I really like that. Yes, uh, definitely. Like you, you need to build that bridge and you need to build that relationship because yeah, it, it, absolutely right. If you go straight away to a teenager and ask questions, they're gonna, <laughs> they, you're gonna, like, uh, <laughs> they're gonna like kick you in the butt and say, yeah. go away, yeah. you weirdo, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> the moment you're over 20, they think you're old. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, now, you were also one of the authors of a paper looking at digital devices and reading engagement. Mm. Um, but and, Deakin uh, University, yeah. 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 Now, my, my view, is, and this is just, um, I, I did actually read a few papers, and I may have read your paper, actually, when I was doing the librarian course. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure about that. But, yeah, I did read uh, some papers. But my understanding is that, um, yeah, a lot of people think that teenagers and young adults like to read digital because they, you know, they all have devices and all that. And my, yeah. I, and I always said, no, 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 no. Actually, my perception is that they, they're sick and tired of using the device all the time, and they actually mm -hmm. like to have the print book because it has no distractions and it's a break from the screen. Mm -hmm. um, could you add to that? I, I would just say that, yeah, if you haven't read the article, it's actually really um, an interesting article because it looks at students across Victoria, but also WA, which obviously not to say that they're very different, but you have two different states. So it's not just one state's education system you're looking at too, which I think is really fantastic um, for kind of similarities and you know, contrasts and stuff. But um, yeah, what came out of that quite strongly was that the digital devices or screens way of reading was very much seen as like an academic thing. Oh, you do it for school. Oh yeah, you can, you can easily quickly download an article or reference a paper. It's just quicker on the screen than having to flip through like a book or like, so they really kind of, in a way the screens were almost um, split between like used for school and then non-screens was private life kind of thing. So there was, it wasn't like a, it wasn't super, like it wasn't like 80% of young people prefer pages. It wasn't like this huge split in the stats that said um, no way to screens when it came to reading um, books and stuff online versus physically. But at the same time, there definitely was like a, a bit of a pitch of no, 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 if I'm reading for fun, if I'm reading like fiction, I, I'm, I'll just grab a book like, but for school, I'm, I'm on my iPad or I'm on my laptop. So um, I think, I, I think if there's, any assumption um, about how young people want to consume content, because that's what it's really about. Um, again, you need to talk to your community. So obviously, um, I shouldn't say obviously, apologies. In that research paper, um, a lot of the young people that they connected with was via their schools. So there's also that understanding that the frame that these young people would have been thinking about when answering these survey questions and stuff would have been the frame of school anyway. So I think if libraries want to look at how they should divert and spend and kind of allocate their budgets for collections for young people. Like it's just one of those things where you just got to go back to your own individual community. Don't assume best practice for one library service in another state is going to be what's good for you and just create a blank overlay. Like you really should just be looking at your own borrowing and your own community because you might find that they are into actually consuming the, the right kind of media, say like graphic novels via their laptops and stuff, but other things they want 
you know, to be just as a hard copy to quickly grab and go while they're in the car or something like that. Cause I don't know about you, but like, depending on what I'm reading on a tram or something, I can get quite like car sick on public transport. Yeah. So I, there's certain things I just can't actually do when I'm on public transport. So like, it, again, it just goes back to like, don't make any assumptions, have a chat, give good context as well. Like if you're talking to students and they've got their like, I'm at school hat on, they're going to give answers based in the school head frame, not in their other head frame. So yeah, there's like those, these kind of research papers are super important. Um, but I also think you have to like not make it the final answer. Yeah. Do your own kind of little internal surveying and research and engagement. That's what it's all. I mean, that's yeah. what public library work is. It's community engagement. So yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, my wife is a lot like that. Uh, she can't, she can't read in the car or on the train or, you know, on the bus. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I've always felt uh, very, very lucky. I'm blessed that I'm not like that. I can read, yeah. I can read anywhere. I can read yeah, anywhere. I don't get sick. Yeah. And for me, it's a pleasure. And uh, Honestly, when I was uh, when I was a student, I did most of the uh, readings for uni. I did them, um, uh, you know, while I was commuting. Um, uh, and for many many years, I actually didn't even have a driver's license. So you know, I was on public transport the whole time, and I loved I loved it was great reading time for me. I love yeah. I love reading yeah. in public transport. Love it. Love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. You're not the only one. I guarantee if you did a little survey for this video, a lot of people would be like, me too, me too. So yeah. 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 Um, now um and or uh, and now uh now actually thinking about these questions, now actually for a lot of people we don't have a um a choice. Like a lot of people are now um just having to read digitally if they wanna borrow anything from the library. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And, you know, like our digital loans have just skyrocketed, absolutely skyrocketed. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, um, so um, I know in, in the last few years, there's been a lot of work on young adult books and, and uh, you know, raising the profile of, of that, like Reading Matters, Love of YA, things like that. Uh, and uh, I know that you've talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, how do you think libraries are going with that? And, you know, um, and if you have an idea as well of how can, uh, how can we build diverse collections for our community? Um, I, again, I'm going to say, like, uh, it's, it's case by case, like each library service that you go to. I feel like it's always in, like, completely reliant and dependent on a staff member two if you're lucky maybe five um who who give a shit do you know what i mean um and uh and i can say like i feel like i've met quite a lot of really amazing curious interested um devoted and kind of pro youth advocates when it comes to like ya content diverse books like all that across all of my years of working in public libraries um and it's not so i think where there are those people working in public libraries, there's work happening. I just think sometimes it's, it's the, the visibility of that work can sometimes be a bit of a labor of love because you could be potentially up against, um, you know, a hierarchy of power that's not necessarily understanding or getting why it matters. Like they think business as usual for the last, you know, 20 years is the fine thing to do and they haven't, why, why change wouldn't doesn't need to be changed kind of thing. Um, and then in other circumstances, you can just see it changing almost overnight because everybody's like, oh, I get it, I get it. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, I think it's still completely in flux and, it's, and it really is because it's dependent on who's actually working where yeah. and um, where they put their energy. So you do have a lot of library services where the children's um, library staff members are also the youth library staff members and you know their requirement of doing it in their embedded kind of everyday programming really is for like the under 10 year olds um and that can be its own consumption of time and um the needs that you have to do internally as well as outreach um and then of course you have some library services where they actually have separate you know youth um, or dedicated people for the 12 and ups and stuff. And so, yeah, it really just is dependent on the service itself um, yeah. and the people who are working in them. So, yeah. Uh, about that, actually, um, 
uh, and because I know that you've been in the U.S. and you come from the U.S. Um, uh, my understanding is that uh, it's a lot more common in the U.S. Uh, for libraries to have a young adult or teen librarian that, than it is here. Is that is that right? I would, I yeah, I would say so. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and when they don't, they call their librarians youth librarians. So, but they're responsible for everybody up to 18, um, but they call it youth librarians. So it has like, it almost kind of like has that, um, a stronger, I guess, linguistic power behind the title of it. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think you've, I don't think I've ever seen a job title here that says teen librarian. That's, um, that's pretty American. Um, but yeah, the teen librarian thing has been pretty kind of popular since probably the seventies, I would say, or eighties, if not the sixties when YA lit really first started kind of being mm. a genre in publication world. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, okay. no, that's fine. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's talk about graphic novels because that's uh, uh that's one of our passions so let's talk about yes. it um we've kind of taken the long way but yeah um and since we're talking a little bit about uh, uh diversity and all that um i i really think that graphic novels are creating some of the most personal intimate and diverse books out there at the moment uh, yeah. is that your perception as well yeah, because I, I came to graphic novels not via comics, not the traditional pathway whatsoever. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Harvey Picard, um, Adrian Tomine, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right, because I, I came across him here and I know he's an American um, graphic novelist. Um, Alison Bechdel, like a, a totally different space. Basically anything that was fantagraphics, I would read, which is like some of that stuff is psychedelic and absolutely bonkers and totally wild. And you're like, wait, I don't even know what's going on because you rely on pictures and graphic novels to help tell the story. And some of the stuff that they published is like an acid trip. So you're just like, uh, okay, cool. But it's all so intriguing and interesting and wild. And I think that's why I love it so much is like the variety of the artwork and the variety of the style. Like I think mm -hmm. some of the misunderstanding um, or the lack of knowledge about graphic novels and the assumptions people make is because they assume it's all Batman um, and that it's all like fighting or it's all um, good versus evil. Yeah, which there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely, like that stuff has its place in storytelling and, and being able to connect people to actually getting into habits of reading. Um, but for me, the graphic novel kind of um, experience was something entirely different. Um, I don't have a problem with comics, obviously. Um, I, my brother read them as a kid and I would take his as well. But in terms of that, that notion of graphic novel, it very much was the, the other, the sort of other style, I guess, that's out there. The, under, the, under, the, the variety that comes from it, like you can read nonfiction memoir in graphic novel form. Like I just find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah, actually, like, um, you know, w w when I started working at libraries, um, w one beautiful moment uh, that I had was uh, with uh, a librarian who, um, you know, much ol uh, older than me and, and who's been in the job for a long time and who was in charge of collections. And, and uh, she said, uh, one day she said to me, Yogi, you're, you're, you're really passionate about graphic novels. And uh, I've never read one. So can you tell me one to read? You know, because I, I order them, uh, but I don't really know much about them. Uh, and, and I said to her, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a couple. And I gave her a couple to read. Um, two quite different ones. Uh, one was uh, a translation of a Spanish one uh, that's called Streak of Chalk uh, that I absolutely love. And the other one was actually um, a memoir. And it was, and I, I don't think I can remember now the name of it. Uh, the title is Rosalie Lining, but I can't remember the, the author, the creator. Sorry yeah. about that, blank. And, uh, and it's a beautiful memoir. It's really sad and heartbreaking, but at the same time, it's really moving and quite heartwarming. Uh, so, you know, because uh, it's essentially they they lost uh, their little girl when she was a, a baby, yeah. Uh, and basically, he made this graphic novel about him and his wife dealing with that loss and you know the their process 
in dealing with that loss. And she read it and she came back to me and she was like, wow, Yurgi, this was just, I love the streak of chalk. You know, it was really nice, but this other one, uh, just, it was amazing. It really, really moved me. And one thing that I loved that she said was, um, I can't see this graphic novel done as a book. I can see why this had to be a graphic novel, yeah. you know? And I think I understand at least a little bit now, you know, the power of this medium and it is different to books and it is different to movies. And yeah. that, that just made my day. And obviously still years later, I still remember, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, that was a beautiful moment. But yeah, it's, it's great when you have those kind of conversations and people come to that realization that yeah, it's a medium, it's a different medium to tell stories um, yeah. with its own strengths as well, you know. But yeah, anyway, um, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the perception of graphic novels at libraries is also changing. You know, I think things are changing, things are progressing. Well, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So like when I started working for um, Melbourne Libraries in 2007, um, they had like a bookcase, like half, half that behind me of um, a mishmash of like manga, some comics, like it didn't make any sense. And part of my job as the youth librarian at the time was to kind of make sense of it, but it was just adult content. I mean, there would have been some appropriate content in there for kids and stuff, but it was just all considered as a broad sweeping graphic novel collection, um, which of course meant that like anybody could pick anything. And there was definitely um, old copies of Battle Royale, the Japanese manga in there and stuff like that. So um, one of my things was really to try to like, not only make sure that the collections were complete because there was some random stuff in there, but to also advocate to actually create a collection just for um, the kids, uh, which is like an all, everybody, all ages collection more or less, which was separate from the adults, so that you wouldn't accidentally have that um, experience of somebody bringing the wrong content home albeit not my problem, I would always say, like parents should be totally on top of what their kids are reading, but it always is helpful to try to just simplify the process for everybody, obviously, and make sure things are a bit more defined. Um, so I think um, over the years, what I've seen is where um, uh, content, like where there was just like graphic novels for adults, is that people are starting to realize this is actually good reading for kids as well. And it is such a barrier breaker. Like it really is something that, um, makes lives people so, like for people so much better. So um, in all the libraries I've worked at where there was junior graphic novels, as we call them, like for the kids collection, the stats are almost as good as picture books or the DVDs that are borrowed for kids. Like the turnover is at least 10 or 11 for these collections, which is phenomenal when you think of like Alia's like base turnover of a good collection is like 4.5 or something like that. Um, so I, I think that it is, I think the numbers help a little bit, even though stats shouldn't be everything. I think the numbers are definitely helping show that this is stuff that people want. And you can get things that you forget are graphic novels and adults kind of go, oh, I read that as a kid. And they just never made the connection, like Asterix and Obelix or Tintin and stuff, like these classic kind of just fun adventure stories that are harmless, like, and they, and the, how they're in kids. And you can actually read those kind of stuff together and um, even kind of bringing in strip comics like Calvin and Hobbes and Garfield, like kids still freaking love Garfield. Um, so I think there's definitely this kind of understanding that one traditional storytelling is not for everybody. This is why audiobooks are so important. This is why, um, you know how there's Vox books now where you can get the picture books that have the audio that reads to you at the same yeah. time. Like you've got so many different ways of being able to tell a story and I think people are just finally starting to actually see the evidence. And usually that does take time. Like, mm. you know, longitudinal studies are good for a reason. It's because you've got evidence over a period of time. Um, it just, it costs money. And you have to make the case as the librarian in charge of collections mm. to actually divert some of your picture book money or divert some of your fiction money or divert some of the other stuff into that path and just trust that it will work for you. Like it will actually, yeah. the numbers will work really hard for you. It's just, you've got to stay on top of it though. I've noticed that you can't just start a collection. You can't just have, no offense, I know that we talked about your stack of books. You can't just have a few really good ones. You actually have to keep feeding it just like you would a fiction collection. You have to be on top of it because the people who are into it, they don't want to reread what they already read. 
Yeah. They want to know, they want the next thing that that same author like um, put out or whatever. They want the next, um, Raina yeah. Taglemeyer is a really good one. She's like prolific pumping out that stuff. Like they don't want to just keep rereading Smile from like five, seven years ago. They want the next best thing. Um, so it's an investment, but it's an investment in community. So I don't, I, I, it, I always find it phenomenal when there aren't graphic novel collections in a library service because it's such a strong investment in community and a strong investment in storytelling. Yeah, actually, um, so um, when I started at Kingston Libraries, uh, um, I started in a brand new library, actually. So it was a brand new building uh, uh, that opened uh, at Westall. And for the first year, when they ran the stats to see, you know, what, what was moving, uh, the, the, the best stats were actually for junior graphic novels. Uh, and and it was like oh this uh, and of course everyone uh, pointed the finger at me like Yuri this is just you you it's you borrowing I'm like no 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 it's not me but it's the kids yeah. it, you know they, yeah. they love this stuff and uh, yeah. and at the moment like um, obviously the most successful one is Dog Man with uh, Dave Pilkey yeah that's yeah. just yeah. insane I mean the the yeah. uh, and he's churning them out so quickly. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. but they they keep reading them and and they're so incredibly popular uh, so yeah uh, definitely if you put the content out there and and you you keep the collection up to date it will pay off absolutely yeah yeah uh, and at the moment actually with uh, with Pilkey and Raina especially the the the, the best-selling ones but uh, there, there's been a huge change uh into uh more graphic novels uh rather than all the traditional kind of superhero stuff and all that and they're really selling really really well so um how could we seize the this opportunity at libraries i think again i think you have to have somebody like yourself um but i'm sure there's like millions of others of us out there working in public libraries who love this content and actually see the value of it you've got to have somebody who's got um, who can work with the collections team to actually invest in it. Like, it's not a, you can't do standing orders for graphic novels. You should be like literally actually going out there and finding those titles and requesting them directly from your suppliers. Um, so, you know, getting to know who the publishers are and actually looking at what they're publishing, not just um, trying to find the authors and what they're doing, because there's so much out there, like so much out there that some libraries have because somebody has actually done the dirty work to figure it out. Um, and other libraries are like, huh, I've never heard of that. Like the kids um, graphic novel series, Ariel, have you heard of it? A-R-I-O-L. Yeah. Like so many people are just like, huh? And it's stupidly popular. It's older, but it's not, I, I think there's still a place for making sure that we, um, expand whatever our collections are and just try to create that space for it and I also think there's no harm and I do this um, I used to do this quite a bit um, depending on what the cover looked like on the graphic novel um, especially if it was a nonfiction, like a memoir or something that um, had like an auto fiction vibe to it so it's based on a true story but wasn't nonfiction. So um, is on those outward face displays when you walk into a library, just because you've got a bunch of adult fiction, why not throw in a couple like graphic novel covers? Like it's that whole idea of stretching people's understanding of what they might like and it just makes the display look really cool um i also have a habit um or i should say had because i'm currently not working in public libraries but i had a habit of like when the graphic novels were on um, on display in the graphic novel section of the outward face display shelves it all be kind of like your, your dc um and marvel comics and stuff and i would literally just take them all down because it's like but that's what everybody expects and i dig through and find all the ones that you know looked totally yeah. totally different that almost looked like they could actually be like a normal book or something um and i put them all on display and they'd all be gone within 48 hours because people are like oh because i think there's also a responsibility of making sure we pull out content from within the collections that might be the unexpected surprise kind of like the memoir that you shared with your colleague where she was just like oh wow i was not expecting that um and i think there's I think it just goes back to um, reducing the stigma a bit around it. So yes. there was a time when public libraries didn't have CDs and DVDs and to introduce DVDs to a public library was a massive, like, oh, I can't believe we're doing this layman's like, and this is not intellectual pursuit, rah, 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 rah. There was a lot of resistance to it. And um, 
we can all say that it's now like it's understood that having movies in libraries is a pathway of storytelling as well. I'm not saying that all movies are indie or art are going to be like enlightening and won't make our brain cells melt. Like I can, you know, like not all movies are great movies, but at the end of the day, it's still another way of telling story. So why, like, why resist something that has such an amazing yeah. capacity to cross over multiple worlds, the arts and literature, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, yeah, I hope that covers. Yeah, that. yeah, I, I, I feel like that as well, you know, like, um, yeah, it's just different forms of storytelling, so yeah. why not have it, you know, and they yeah. should all have their own place. Uh, that's one of the big things as well that are, that I've talked about with a lot of librarians, like graphic novels need their own section. You know, like yes. you have audio books, yeah. you have movies, and you yeah. have graphic novels because they are a different medium. Uh, yeah. You know. uh, so um, so that, that, that's important to me. And um, yeah, I think uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about as well is uh, um, uh, uh, what, what you mentioned about, you know, looking around and, you know, just seeing what's being published because there's so much that's being published, it's true. And one of the things that we want to do so with, with this group, with Dahlia Graphic is, and we've started doing it, is uh, uh, we want to have a, a monthly graphic novels roundup. So, of course, it doesn't cover everything that's published, you know, but uh, it's just some recommendations or some things that we think, well, these things are published, uh, these books are published this month and we think they're worth having. Yeah. And, and it's always... I always try to make sure that there's a balance, you know, because you could easily fill uh, the list with just Marvel and DC uh, because they publish so much stuff and so many books, but uh, yeah. you need to have different things and you need to have your Fantagraphics and you need to, to have your top yeah. shelf and your yeah. Boom Studio and because they, yeah. they all have different stories, you know. Uh, yeah. and different creators and different styles. So, um, and, uh, and me, for example, I grew up in Europe, so of course I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna put some European comics there as well if I can, because yes. they're awesome some and they're different. Some stuff in translation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's, and this is the thing, like we have like homegrown comics, um, comics fairs and comics festivals, like there's stuff like trying to happen like that in um, Australia, but, you go to Europe and they've got, I can't remember the name of it, so I apologize, but in France every year, they have like one of the biggest Angoulême. global graphic novels, yeah, conferences in the world in France. And it's like massive and they have awards attached to it and like people can get grants to go attend it and stuff like, there's just such a huge respect, I think, for it as a storytelling medium. And it's, and it's not because um, they're more pompous than us or anything like that. It's just because they, they've had that as a, because um Tintin is originally Belgian like it's and Asterix is French isn't it like isn't Asterix and Obelix a French one or yes, is it German yeah correct me sorry I believe um, so. so yeah and it's like it, it, we sometimes forget the history of the things that we grew up with in love and adore and it's like it comes from something else and they labored to get it to the point where we can enjoy it so what's wrong with a little bit of labor on our part to get it to the point for the next generations to enjoy it as well um and what, oh, and there's the even fact that like Alison Bechdel's um, fun home graphic novel is a Broadway play right now. Well, nobody's yeah. going to it, obviously, because of everything going on. But it was like a really expensive Broadway play situation. Yeah. And they had it here in Australia as well. Like, so I, I think if we can really just show people and showcase that it's, it's beautiful storytelling, it just comes with some really unique art and that isn't demeaning as an adult to read that. Um, I think we're doing really, really good. And, and it's possible that, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, throw a graphic novel club, but if your community is into it, like have a graphic novel reading club or, you know, showcase on, um, you know, how carousels with Spidus and all the different kind of like library management systems on your catalogs that you like have books of the latest, like top reads and yeah. stuff. Why not throw some graphic novels in there? It doesn't cause any harm. All it does is expose your collection get over yourselves like because right. I feel like when people don't put that stuff on there it's because they've got some sort of like um highbrow thinking about it or whatever um and there's some graphic novels out there that are pretty poncy like I read one about wine making 
um, a few years ago. It was in translation from a French, um, he was a journalist hanging out with his winemaker, sommelier friend in the French like countryside. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like a really big one and a gorgeous artwork, but it was like all about winemaking, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, come on. So it, it's not all like fart jokes and stuff like that. So it's something I think that if people just gave it a little bit of time and it's kind of like coming to reading, you've got to pick a few and hope yeah. that one of them sticks under your skin a bit. And that's all you need. It's just that one, like your colleague had yeah. just, just the one, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, 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 yeah. As I always, um, as I always say to whoever listens, you know, like with graphic novels, <laughs> it's exactly the same as with books, you know, yeah. just tell me the kind of things that you're interested in, that, uh, interested in the kind of stories that you're interested in. And I'll tell you what yeah. graphic novel to read because yeah. all, all genres are really represented there. So, you know, there's a graphic novel Absolutely. for everyone. Absolutely. Um, now, yeah. um, and, and you, you, you've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, that, that stigma kind of thing and, you know, for, you know, like it's for kids kind of thing. And, and that really there are a lot of great graphic novels for adults. And, and uh, the, the American Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable, um, I was really happy with this. They, they made an announcement a few months ago and they've started, uh, they have a committee now. And so every year they're going to be publishing also a, uh, a list of great graphic novels for adults. So it's something like JALSA in the US has been doing for a long time uh, for yes. teens. So they're doing yeah. something like that uh, for adults as well. And I think that that's going to be quite a game changer because uh, the American Library Association is a huge organization, obviously. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and uh, this group doing this as well, I think it's going to be quite a game changer. So I think... I hope so. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. And I think, uh, uh, um, yeah, I think it's really going to make a difference so, uh, uh, in changing perceptions. So, um, yes. we should probably finish. Uh, I mean, I yes. could keep talking for hours, uh, uh, but yeah, we, people we want to listen. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah. I thought, uh, to finish, I'd ask you about three comics or graphic novels that you've read recently. Yeah. And if you'd like to share what you've been reading. Yeah. Um, so, uh, at the moment I'm not reading at all. New job. My brain is like, kind of suctioned out into actually producing rather than consuming. Okay. Um, but before I changed jobs, I um, had a bunch of new graphic novels come through the library and just be recommended to me. So the three, the last three that I read um, was um, the, a Chilean graphic novel written by an Australian writer though, on behalf of her Chilean Australian friends sort of memoir story um, called Esther. Um, and that has a little bit more of a traditional graphic novel feel. Like even the cover almost looks like a superhero cover, but it's actually just a Chilean flag, traditional kind of colors that you often find on flags, um, as well as superheroes. Um, and then Rainbow Rowell, who is a traditional um, YA writer, uh, put her foot into the graphic novel world and did um, Pumpkin Heads, um, which, is like that really colorful, uh, just really comfortable, like easy. Like it's not, it's not too wacky. It's not too um, comic-y looking, but at the same time, it's very much that traditional format that you see with a Rain Attack on Meyer book or something. So you can always see there being a whole like, oh, like kids start here and then they move here and then they move here kind of thing with that one. Yeah. And it was very rom-com, cutesy. Like I could tell what was coming in um, Pumpkin Heads, but it was still like lovely to kind of read because I do miss that part of American culture, which is the autumnal season and everybody being obsessed with pumpkin everything. Like yeah. I, that is actually a thing. Um, and the other one that I read, um, which is, totally different than those two I like to think is Are You Listening by um, Tilly Walden um, which is kind of more my style of graphic novel which is just super arty and a little bit fantastical a little bit magical real um, mm. so I the literature that I was obsessed with in high school was all magical realism out of um, South America and so I love when you can find a graphic novel that actually somehow visually creates that experience whilst also reading it um, mm. so even though um, I'm not 100% sure what happened 
in the Tilly Walden graphic novel, um, I really enjoyed it because it was just, it was stunning. It was beautiful artwork. And I, I, was it watercolor or colored pencil or something? Like it was just this really kind of magical stuff and it was a bit wacky. And, um, but when I say wacky, I don't mean wacky like, um, oh, like acid trip wacky. I just mean almost like a little bit Neil Gaiman, like but, but, but softer, just gentler, a little yeah. bit more human, not so supernatural. Like almost, it's like magical realism, honestly. Like you feel like, oh, this could have actually happened, but it's not, it's fantastical. Um, and quickly, sorry, going back yeah. to um, the Chilean one, Esther, that, that's that whole format of memoir and storytelling. And sometimes you get such a better impact through a graphic novel, I think, than you do just through mm. text when telling memoir, because so many subtle things can be said through the images of graphic novels, especially I think when you're trying to tell um, what is potentially a very traumatic and violent um, and kind of horrific story. Because of course, being a Chilean graphic novel, like the story really is predominantly during um, Pinochet's dictatorship and all the sort of mm. oppression that um, people, especially if you were slightly left or queer or, socialist or cared about your fellow human beings at all um just the experience that you had to if you gave a shit and how dangerous it was to just give a shit and to be different um and of course her escape to come to australia as part of that story um and the artwork really gives what graphic novels are so good at doing which is the subtlety and the nuance that you don't get if you just took the text out of it um so i think esther was really good kind of example of that perfect kind of streamlined graphic novel where the words say a little bit but the pictures like amp up the experience like totally and you just kind of like wow that's some intense shit yeah <laughs> yeah so that's yeah, those are the um, three the last three that i read those are three really good picks actually yeah all three of them are, are i've really enjoyed them and very different all three of them uh yeah, yeah, yeah. i love to start uh really really a uh, great graphic novel and i'm i'm very interested in um in history and politics and i know a little bit about chile as well because uh, um my parents have a, a chilean friend and i've heard stories about her when she left chile and things like that as well so i was really interested in that and uh we uh, with tilly uh, with tilly walden i feel like she does a lot of what you were saying there as well she does a lot of storytelling visually. And yeah, yeah. that's something that I really love about her. I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, yeah. if, if, have you read any other book from her? No, I, that, I think that's my first foray into her. Like, so like when you said that she'd actually done a few, I was like, oh, I had no idea. So I'm just glad that I got to stumble across the one even. So yeah. Uh, you, you, you should look her up because uh, I think you're gonna really, really like her style. I, yeah. I'm a huge fan of hers and I, uh, I always feel like nothing much happens in her books, but I, I love every single panel in her book. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, there's just something about her style and uh, that is just beautiful. Uh, and her first graphic novel was actually about uh, um, ice ice skating, not the kind of thing that I'm really into. I absolutely loved uh, yeah. the graphic novel from the first page to the end. I thought it was beautiful, a beautiful story, oh, really yeah. beautifully told. Yeah. And uh, the other one that she did was on a sunbeam, which is a science fiction. Again, it's got a lot of really weird stuff going on. Uh, yeah. um, and it's, it's a brick that's actually a really thick graphic novel. Yeah. Um, I loved every single page. Uh, yeah. Amazing. So yeah, really good picks. So yeah. yeah, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so thank you for your time and for this conversation. And, uh, and you know, um, so you started a new job. Good luck with that. And hopefully we haven't lost you uh, at libraries forever. I'd like to think I'm up, uh, up leveling so I can go in there and do some more damage when I come back. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, and that's not a threat, by the way. No, no. I mean, I'm talking about like the good kind of damage, like almost like a, what is it, a renovation or something. No, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But yes, I, I don't up, think I do anything picking quietly. Picking up so. more wisdom and skills to come back yeah. with, yeah. Do we Excellent. need to be diplomatic here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Yeregi, for having me. Thank you so much. And good luck with the group and everybody else. And I look forward to seeing some future little conversations like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.